My name is Matt Phelps. I'm an engineer from Galveston, Texas, down in an area where we have a lot of experience with hurricanes. We're up here trying to help folks with Hurricane Sandy and the claims and the issues that they're facing. One of the things that faces a lot of homeowners is that they have both wind damage and flood damage. Flood is handled by FEMA. Wind is handled by your homeowner's policy or a specific windstorm policy. How do you know which claim to turn in for what? What are the specific things that you need to know? Well, one of the things that you need to be aware of is that you've got an elevation issue if you have a flood in your, on your, in your property. One of the things that homeowners are faced with is that the elevation that they have to comply with depends on where the home is located. The elevation is measured at different parts of the home depending on which FEMA flood zone you're located in. If you are located in the FEMA V zone, the elevation is measured at the lowest horizontal framing member of the structure. Even if you're up on pilings and your house is six feet off of the ground, it is measured at the bottom of what we call the stringers or the joist. Now, that's a very significant issue because you may have a finished floor elevation that's 18 inches above that. That difference is the difference between whether or not you're compliant or not. So when someone comes out to measure the, the elevation for you to get the uh, elevation certificate for your home, it is imperative that that person know which FEMA flood zone you're located in. The next FEMA zone is called the A zone. In the A zone, they recommend that you measure the elevation at the lowest horizontal framing member, but you may, you may measure it at the finished floor elevation. That could be a difference of as much as 18 inches or even more, even two feet, depending on how your house is built. That is a huge difference. If you have to raise your house two feet, that is an extremely expensive process. But it all depends on which FEMA zone you're located in. The other zone is Coastal A. In the Coastal A zone, you also have a recommendation that it be measured from the lowest, lowest horizontal framing member, but you can choose to measure it from the finished floor elevation. Those are things that are critical to you, the homeowner, and they are the things that will either put money in your pocket or take money away. You need to arm yourself with knowledge. When someone talks to you about the lowest horizontal framing member, what, what does that mean? What do you go out, what do you look for? What do you see that you can point to and say, that's the lowest horizontal framing member? That's very simple. That is what the pilings that your house is sitting on are attached to. They usually go around it around the house and you've got pilings that are in a maybe a rectangular pattern or a square pattern whatever the shape of your house may be and they will have a very large piece of lumber usually a 2 by 12 or something like that and maybe multiple ones and they are attached to the top of the pilings those are commonly called stringers that's what we in the trade call them the top of that is the lowest horizontal framing member that is what we're talking about. Another term that you're going to hear is finished floor elevation. What is that? That's the carpet. That's the tile. That's the hardwood floors. That's what you're walking on is your finished floor elevation. Now, I don't mean the one on the second floor. I mean the one on the bottom floor, on the one on closest to the ground. So, but to look at the difference. If you've got stringers that are made out of 2 by 12s they, that's a foot. Let's say you've got a floor joist on top of that that's a, a 2 by 8 Now we're up at uh, tw 20 inches, almost 2 feet, changing diff big difference in elevation. Arm yourself with knowledge and you'll be protected. A couple of things that homeowners need to think about, and this is not just homeowners but property owners of commercial buildings as well, is how should you, what should you logically expect to happen if there is a damage to your property? Well, the first thing that you should look for, is there a change? Is something different than the way that it was before? Do you have a door that doesn't open and close the way that it used to? Do you have windows that won't open and close the way that they used to? Do you have a leak? Do you have the sounds of 
hearing sounds in your house? Do you hear uh, traffic that's going by that you used to not hear? All of those are the things that are the telltale signs. Damage to structures is a lot like cancer. My mother died from cancer. You couldn't tell she had cancer by looking at her. She had some telltale signs that she could tell to a doctor and he confirmed it by testing. That is what we do. We do the testing that diagnoses the illness that your structure has and then we develop the causation model that ties that back to the storm event that caused it. We do a lot of different types of testing. My company does about 12 or 15 different standard methods of testing and so the type that we do is entirely dependent upon number one the type of structure that you have, how it's built and what it's built from, but also where you're located and what symptoms we are either seeing or that you are telling us about. For example, if your structure has a flat roof, we will evaluate that roof to determine if it's been wind lifted by using a dome uplift test. If you have a shingled roof, we have a patented method that we use to uplift the shingles to determine if they've been wind lifted or not. So you have to have, you can't possibly diagnose what's wrong if you haven't done the research and know what the illness is. You can't possibly determine what does the scope of work need to be if you don't clearly understand what's wrong. That is what we're trying to do and that's what we need to give you so that you're armed with the correct information that you get a cost estimate that's done by a competent professional that is believable and it can actually be carried out to return your home to the way that it was prior to the storm. When one of, one, when one of us, one of our group of professionals comes out to try and help you, there's several pieces of information that we need to know and that you need to be able to provide. That includes things like when was your home built? If you don't know, your county tax assessor's office can tell you. That's information that you can probably get off of the internet from the Texas or the uh, county tax assessor's website. What are the policy provisions? A copy of the deck page is very helpful to be able to tell what is covered and what is not. The other, one of the other things that we need for you to include in the information that you give to the professional that's investigating your, your, your damage is a narrative of what happened. If you were there, describe what it is you saw, what you heard, what you felt. Did you feel the pressure drop in your house? Did your eardrums pop? Did you see windows and walls bowing in and out with the force of the wind? Those are things that lots of homeowners have told us these stories. Some of them are, are horrific. Do you have photos? There are three things that are the most important thing in processing an investigation like this and they are photos, photos, photos. Those are more important than anything else that we can have. They are the central part of the communication that we give to someone who reads our reports. It is very difficult to show somebody, particularly a, uh, an administrative type person, numbers and charts and graphs if they are not supported with photos. The sooner after the event occurs that the photos are taken, the better. And not just your house. Get the neighbor's house. This isn't a storm that just popped out of the sky and only landed on your house. It took care of other people's houses too. So get photos of everything, of the neighborhood. That is an important part. This is not an isolated incident. This is a very large storm. It covered several thousand square miles. So you want to be sure to document everything in your neighborhood. That gives us the evidence that we include in our report to make sure that what we are developing as, as the facts that relate to the damage on your structure get communicated adequately and clearly to the administrators that are going to review it and make the decisions on getting your claim satisfied. When one of our investigators comes out to visit with you and look at your property, it can be one of many different professionals that are there to try and help you. 
The first thing that they're going to do is define the scope of work that needs to be done to give your building, your home, your structure the investigation that it needs. That may include professionals that are investigating your windows, your doors. If this is a commercial building with curtain walls, certainly that would be a big part of it. Skylights, the roof is always a big part of it. If there has been structural movement, there will be an engineer that will be included in this mix that will be there to take measurements and perform a variety of tests. Which test will be performed is a function of what type of damage is observed. It is extremely important that physical damage be tied into the causation model that caused the physical damage. If there is no physical damage, fine. Let's quit and go home. If there is physical damage, then we have to have causation of what caused that. We have to prove that this was the event that had sufficient force or sufficient power that it caused this type of damage. And that is done by taking specific measurements. It's done by collecting specific data. It's done by performing specific tests that reveal whether or not that structure could have been damaged by the cause that was present or the storm that occurred. There's many different types of, of damage that occur in buildings in a storm like this. I know that hurricanes are not a frequent occurrence up in this part of the world. In my hometown of Galveston, Texas, uh, areas of Florida where I work a lot, hurricanes are an annual threat and they happen on a too frequent basis for those of us that live there and endure them. But we have a lot of experience with them. We know what to look for. We've been there, done that. Some types of damages can be investigated by a contractor, for example. It could be a roof. It could be part of the building envelope. Other more specific pieces of those uh, build, of the building envelope, for example, require a very specialized trained person to investigate, and that would be a window and glazing specialist such as Ivan Browner from TSSA StormSafe. Those are the guys that know how to investigate windows, plus they've done thousands of windows that have been damaged from hurricanes, so they know what to look for. And a lot of these things are very subtle. It's kind of like what I said a moment ago about cancer. You can't really see it and it takes some testing. You have to remove some things to view what is really wrong. And that's what they are really a profession at and really, really good at it and have been able to help hundreds, if not thousands, of homeowners, condo owners, and building owners, not just in Florida, but around the United States. Sometimes you have structural damage. Sometimes you have broken framing members. Sometimes you have fasteners that have been pulled apart. Sometimes you have separation of the sill plate from the foundation. All of those things can happen and they have to be investigated by a licensed professional engineer. Anything structural is a licensed PE. They're the only ones that can do that. Anything that is Another part of the building envelope, whether it's a roof or whether it's a, uh, a set of windows, for example, some engineers, like our firm, we do that, but it's because we work with other people that are really, really good at it, such as, such as Ivan and, uh, and his team. Another thing that is needed is the experience, and I cannot overemphasize this, an experienced estimator. Just because something is broken, that doesn't mean that it can just be fixed by itself. Brian Moyer is an experienced estimator. He works with this team on a, on a huge basis, an extremely important individual to this team, that it doesn't matter if you only know what needs to be replaced. It is what has to be done to actually make that happen. You want your house fixed. Well, that's what we're here to do. And that involves more than just replacing component parts. It is what has to be done to actually get that in there and make it work right. So it takes a team of professionals, and that's what we have to offer. A team approach is what really is required to investigate these types of claims. And 
a lot of times it involves different professionals and that understand the different scopes that are included in the investigation. Not just one individual is doing everything. It's hard to have one size fits all. It takes just like a football team, you have different players performing different functions. Somebody's got to be a blocker, somebody's got to run the ball, somebody's got to get downfield to catch the pass. And that's exactly what our team does. And we all know what our positions are. We know what it is we're supposed to do. So you may have an engineer that is looking at the foundation of a structure. They may be looking for broken concrete. They may be looking for misplaced uh, or broken uh, uh, ties. They might be looking for uh, displaced or broken fasteners. Those are things like nails and screws. Maybe you have hurricane clips that are on your house that are attaching one structural member to another that are held in place by nails or, or other types of fasteners. Those are things that we're looking at. And sometimes there are damage to them that is subtle. Sometimes they're damaged because they got so much salt water on them that now they're corroding and they're no longer going to be able to perform their function. They've got to be replaced. That's a subtle thing. But experienced engineers, experienced windows and glazing professionals, experienced estimators, we know what to look for. That's what we do for a living and that's what we bring to you to make sure that you get restored to your pre-loss condition. Now, that is an observing physical evidence and photographing it and preserving it. A lot of times we collect samples and we have a warehouse full of them from different cases around the country that we're able to bring out and say, this is what we're talking about. This is what we actually, oh and here's the pictures of it. This is where it actually came from. That's really powerful information and that may be involved in part of what has happened on the investigation at your house. But you have to be able to tie causation to damage. And that involves a lot of different things. It involves a lot of math. It involves a lot of weather data. And one of the things that is a big issue in Hurricane Superstorm Sandy is wind. Now, wind pressure is equal to density of air divided by 2 times the velocity of the wind squared. Velocity divided times itself. This varies according to height and the velocity of the wind is not the wind speed that is reported in the popular media. Oh, the wind was blowing 50 miles an hour. That's not what we use. We use a specific part of that that's called a three-second gust. A three-second gust, depending on where you're located, whether you're inland or whether you're located on the, uh, close to the coast, could be 30 or 40 percent or more than what the reported average wind speed is. So wind affects structures not just in a long-term pushing against the structure, but it can also affect the structure with an explosive force that only lasts for just maybe just a fraction of a second. That's what we call a three second wind gust. Everybody is familiar with examples of explosions where you have a very rapidly moving mass of air that will knock down a building. It didn't blow for days and days and days. That happened in an instant. And that is exactly what we're talking about here. It is the wind gust that can cause the damage, not the long sustained wind. The other thing that happens is the wind doesn't stay the same all the time. It blows and stops, blows and stops, it goes from this direction and blows this direction and as the storm passes by it's now blowing from this direction. But it doesn't blow at the same speed. That's called buffeting. Wind buffeting creates a whole additional type of problems on structures that can cause it to fail way below its designed wind speed. And that is something that we have to really think through carefully and really look at the data and make sure that the damage profile that we saw 
matches up with the causation model that represents and is taken from the actual weather conditions that occurred at that property. How do we tie all this stuff together? You know, it's great that you got somebody can go out and, and observe and document damage. It's great that you got somebody that can create a in-depth, specific causation model that is unique to your property, to your structure. All those things are great, but how do you tie all this stuff together? Because the end game here is you want your house fixed. Most property owners, they don't really, they're not interested in all this stuff. They just want their problems fixed. And that's what we're here to do. But, you know, the Texas Tech Red Raiders would really like to win some football games, but you got to have a game plan to make it happen. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. It starts with having a scope of work that really does explain what needs to be investigated and why. SOW, we're going to start with a scope of work. Then we're going to have a series of professionals that are evaluating that structure depending on what your damage is, what we've identified in the scope of work. So that's going to begin with, let's say, window and glazing. They're going to come out and do an in-depth investigation of your windows, your doors, your curtain walls, your skylights. It depends on each individual structure. For example, shopping malls don't have a whole lot of windows. They sure got a lot of skylights. Residential structures have lots of windows. They seldom have curtain walls. Commercial buildings, particularly retail, they have a lot of glass curtain walls. All of those things are investigated, and the way that they are investigated is they're all a little bit different. But that's going to result in a window and glazing report that that professional is going to come out and investigate it, do the types of investigations that are needed for those unique types of windows, the unique system, window system that's installed in that structure. That's going to come into a report that's going to go to an engineer. All right, that engineer is going to take that damage and he's going to compare it and add it to damage that he has documented that is usually structural damage. Some guys may also do roofs and, uh, and um, things like that. But then he's going to develop what we call the causation model and that's going to tie these things together. But that still doesn't, that, that hadn't got the ball over the goal line. We've still got some more work to do. That has got to go to the estimator. The estimator has got to be able to take these pieces of information and put dollars and cents to them, and that's S-E-N-C-E, -E, not C-E-N-T-S. Dollars and cents because you've got to make it work. It's not enough to know how much a window costs. You have to know, wait a minute, there's asbestos in this siding. It's got to be removed. That adds a lot of cost to it. It's not just any window, it's a window that has a certain pressurization to that, a certain design wind speed. The engineer has got to identify that so that the estimator can run downfield and catch the ball. That is how all of these things come together to turn this into one thing that you want to see and that is a touchdown. And that will get your structure fixed.